Hello. Today I would like to explore another one of Plato's timeless tellings of the traditional Greek myths, timeless renderings of the traditional Greek myths. Now, this myth is taken from the Phaedrus, and it, uh, it describes basically a, um, a, an Egyptian god that comes to a king and uh, sort of to uh, proffer these different gifts of technology. Um, the, the king's name is Thaumas, and uh, Plato writes, uh, to him came uh, Theoth is the, the name of the god. Sometimes this is also seen, so, uh, some people might be familiar with the name Thoth. Um, so sometimes Theoth, sometimes Thoth. Uh, Theoth and, uh, showed his inventions, desiring that the other Egyptians might be allowed to have the benefit of them. Uh, Thoth enumer enumerated the inventions, and Thaumas, the king, inquired about their several uses, and praised some of them and censured others, as he approved or dis disapproved of them. It would take a long time to repeat all that Thaumas said, to Thoth in praise or blame of the various arts. But when it came to letters, so the art of writing, this, said Thoth, will make the Egyptians wiser and give them better memories. So Thoth is uh, sort of praising the virtues of his, own, of his own invention. It is specific both for the memory and for the wit, says Thoth. Thaumas replies, oh, most ingenious Thoth, the parent or inventor of an art is not always the best to judge of its utility. Um, and so uh, basically, th that's a, a short excerpt from, uh, from Plato's dialogue, the Phaedrus. And uh, it, with this lecture, I would just like to, uh, kind of in the spirit of, of, of the last lectures, uh, to just sort of explore this myth and try to, try to unfold some, uh, some kind of interesting or uh, in, uh, insightful, uh, insightful elements to this myth. Um, and I sort of have three, three broad uh, categories that I will uh, explore uh, through this lecture. And, and so I'll just uh, briefly enumerate those and then uh, go into each one of them uh, and then, uh, and then uh, conclude after that. Uh, the, first, the first basic theme that I'll explore a little bit is the kind of uh, the internal, the, the contradiction of technology. And um, there's, there's, of course, that, that itself could be the theme of of, uh, of a thousand lectures, and so I won't go, uh, can't expect to go too far into that theme. But I do think uh, that the myth of Thoth gives us again a kind of uh, a special tool of, of insight, a special way of organizing our, our thoughts around a given issue like technology. So the first, the first um, element that I will explore is the technology and the kind of the contradiction of technology. Uh, that's number one. And then number two uh, will be a kind of um, return to this perennial theme uh, of, of, uh, of Plato, which is the sort of uh, the, 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 the difference between seeming to be wise and uh, truly being wise. And often there's, again, a sort of contradiction or paradox where uh, often seeming to be wise comes at the expense of uh, truly being wise. And in some ways, the truly wise person might appear to be a fool to somebody who doesn't have, who, who lacks the discernment and discrimination to, to recognize that. And um, this is, of course, a familiar, a familiar theme, uh, most notably from, from Plato's uh, 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 timeless uh, parable of the cave. Um, and so, so that's the, the second thing that I'll explore after technology is the, the, uh, the paradox of, uh, of apparent wisdom and true wisdom. Um, and then the third element is uh, something of, uh, I might call it, uh, the, uh, as, for lack of a better word, the, the kind of disconnect or alienation that can, that uh, that Plato is bringing our attention to, that can follow from, um, from technology and, and specifically writing as something like an an archetype of all technology. Um, and uh, after that, uh, that's that will be after that I will be uh, conclude the lecture. And so, um, so so again, sort of three elements, and and with that I will return to the first one, which um, was again. Uh, kind of an exploration of technology and the kind of uh, inherent contradiction in the sort of virtues and, and vices of technology, or the, the, the advantages, the benefits, and the drawbacks. Um, now, it should be said, often we, I, I think especially today, we uh, tend to view technology and tend to associate technology with progress. Um, and, of course, there's nothing inherently uh, false or incorrect about that. Uh, but what can be said is it's perhaps uh, one-sided, and, um, and and Plato, I think, with this myth, he helps us to uh, he, again. He helps give us a tool or a kind of 
um, an image to help us uh, conceptualize how that might be the case. Um, and so, so again, we often, we, we, we often first notice what's most salient to us is the way in which um, we, we, is, we, we first perceive what is gained through a technology, what is gained through usefulness, utility, efficiency, effectiveness. Um, we usually think of what is gained, uh, but much less of uh, sort of, you know, what is lost, what is sacrificed. And I think the, the myth of Thoth can help us to, uh, to actually sort of see the other side of this, what, what's ordinarily uh, sort of less, less obvious, less salient to us. Um, we usually think of, with technology, we think of, you know, what it does for us. Um, that's the one side, the obvious side, uh, but, you know, the less obvious, but, but uh, certainly no less important side. Um, we think of what it does to us. We very rarely think of uh, what it does to us. So we're thinking of technology as a means, um, a means to help us accomplish given ends. We don't often think of the way in which those very same means work back upon us. In some ways, everything we do also does us, um, including uh, a kind of exegesis or exploration of myths. And so, again, there's, this, is, this is a kind of a general principle, but we're uh, here specifically inquiring to the way in which technology works in those kind of um, contradictory or paradoxical ways. Um, the, again, um, and, and this re will relate to the second theme that, that uh, I will pick up on in a moment, but uh, Plato immediately, you know, he uses, the, he uses this myth to illustrate the, the, way in which, the way in which the use of writing, it actually, uh, um, the, minute, the moment that a person can rely on, on writing, uh, by analogy, it's like the way that a person who, who is walking, uh, a person with uh, the healthy ability to walk, um, if he or she begins to depend on crutches to walk, starts to use crutches, um, this person will, or we can see this even if a person uh, ceases, uh, a person augments his or her walking by, by riding a horse or riding a donkey or, ride, or driving in a car all the time. We see the way in which uh, driving in a car has, uh, you know, especially deleterious health consequences to uh, just like physical constitution of a person. Um, similarly, using crutches, it can impair the ability to, to walk without them. So in the same way, Plato just points out that uh, the moment we become reliant on the written word, uh, something begins, a certain capacity we have begins to atrophy in us, a certain internal capacity to, to organize our thoughts and uh, to basically access the, um, the kind of uh, internal coherence of our memories, of uh, knowledge, knowledge that's, that's, um, knowledge that's not just atomic bits of knowledge, but that we have worked upon and organized and so somehow, you know, ordered within the, the archive of our memory, so to speak, using a metaphor. Um, it's inherently ordered and relate, uh, you know, coherent within our own, uh, con you know, our own field of concepts that we have. And this is not necessarily the same uh, to encounter this in writing. And, and the moment we rely on writing, we're kind of confronted from something, something external to us. And the risk is, uh, is to sort of, you know, fundamentally um, kind of mistake, uh, mistake having access to that information to mistake that for actually understanding that information. Again, this is sort of uh, encroaching on the second theme. And so just to return again to the kind of internal paradox of technology, um, one, one, one element that makes this myth uh, so delightful in a way is because it has the, the same sort of uh, kind of internal structure as a joke. And by that I just mean um, it, we, we, we so, so readily associate the advent of writing with kind of like the dawn of intellectual culture, um, and and so to uh, for for Plato to be uh, criticizing writing, and you know kind of uh, basically um, you know levying exactly the kind of criticisms against writing that we we ordinarily associate with its virtues. Um, this again, it, it sort of it, it it makes the myth uh, especially especially uh, you know especially enjoyable to read just because it. It shares that kind of internal structure with a joke, really, where it sets up a certain tacit expectation and then kind of topples that expectation. Um, and so, so you know, again, one would imagine that writing is kind of, in some ways, the the the, the archetypal technology, and that it enables a kind of um, uh, a kind of outsourcing of uh, of internal capacities that we, we kind of possess in a, a dormant or an internal state. Uh, we can objectify them and outsource them and augment them through technology. And writing, again, is that kind of, uh, that principle applied to the, 
the intellect. Um, writing, we often think of, um, you know, even there, there are even some contemporary philosophers who argue uh, for what's sometimes called the extended, um, they call it the extended mind thesis. I think it should be called the extended brain thesis. But the idea that you can somehow, um, your brain is not, uh, it, it's not, um, it's not delimited by the dimensions of your cranium. Rather, your brain can extend to every time you, you take notes, right, or, or uh, open a book, for instance. Or today, I mean, this is even more, uh, just more extreme, uh, the moment we have access to, to, um, to the internet, through, you know, and especially like in portable through the smartphones, we're sort of plugged into this, this, uh, this kind of in, infinite sea of, of, of knowledge. And, and the, I guess that Plato is, is uh, sort of um, warning us that uh, this infinite sea of not we can get we can get lost at sea in a way if we're not able to maintain the, the ability to um, to still kind of uh, differentiate between between uh, having access to to these thoughts and actually uh, sort of ha making them our own um, you know grasping them truly grasping them um, again another another sort of element that makes this myth uh, I'm, I'm, I'm comparing it to a joke, not as though it's false, but that it's um, something about something about hearing a joke is it, it, it's it's pleasant a little bit, and, and this myth is the same way. Another reason, uh, and I suggested one reason is the kind of the top limit of an expectation. Another sort of similar reason is uh, is is the, the, the fundamental irony that uh, you know here we are um, here we are reading a myth that's warning us against writing, um, and so it's. Again, it's kind of like a, it's a sort of liar's paradox or an internal contradiction where it, 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 it says one thing, but, in, but it does something else. That be, you know, a, a, a contradiction between the semantic content and the performative content of, uh, you know, of the myth itself. And this is actually something it shares probably most, most notably with, with another sort of, uh, another, uh, you know, traditional famous, famous piece of, of world literature, which is uh, which is the, the the Chinese the classic Taoist text called the Tao Te Ching, and um, this is a kind of uh, uh, Lao Tzu is the author of the Tao Te Ching. He was a contemporary of Confucius, and um, it's a kind of uh, Taoism is often contrasted with Confucianism as a sort of a much more uh, natural or mystical mystical and spiritual approach to to uh, ordering ordering one's life. And um, the Tao Te Ching uh, notoriously opens with the line, um, and it, of course this is translated from Chinese, so there are many different ways to translate it, but the gist of it is something like, um, the Tao that can be written or the Tao that can be spoken is not the Tao. Um, if, you can, if you can speak about it, if you can uh, write about it, it's not it. Uh, and then, uh, needless to say, Lao Tzu proceeds to then uh, you know, write an entire book um, about about uh, on the Tao Te Ching or a, a book about the Tao, and um, it's it's probably maybe notice, notable actually that Socrates and Lao Tzu were um, rough contemporaries. They both lived approximately 500 BC, or in the fifth century BC is a, a better way to say it. Okay, and so the last thing uh, to be said about about technology and writing is just sometimes I think it can be difficult for us to really understand the, the, um, the um, well, uh, again, not only, so not only the, the immensity of the, of the, the transformation in, in society and in life that the advent of writing, the advent of, of text as a technology, and interesting, the word text and technology, those are the, they derive from the same word in Greek. Uh, it's a uh, verb, it's a word called techne, and it means something like, again, uh, means or method or work. Um, it's, uh, in fact, the word, uh, Plato uses this word in, in the, um, in the, uh, in this, this, uh, dialogue, this, specifically this myth itself, he uses the word technai, and technai, actually, the name technai, again, it comes from the same word in Greek, it re liter literally referred to a, a, a kind of a handbook of grammar, a handbook of grammar, and so we can see this, uh, the Greeks perceived, a, a an implicit association between, um, text and technology and, and, and work techne and means and uh, and then of course we we uh, think of technology and those all things all share some kind of um, you know they they, sh they have a similar essence they're kind of like cousins or something 
Um, but I think it can be difficult for us to, um, uh, per perhaps we can succeed in grasping the what a fundamental uh, transformation that the advent of, of text would um, would effect upon human life. Um, and, but in, but in order, to, kind of. In, but again, I think our our attention will be drawn to the the the, the progressive and the, the advancement element of it. And I think again, that's partly true. But I just want to say a little bit uh, by way of um, just hoping to illuminate maybe the way the world would have been uh, before text. And, and, you know, we never have lived in that world really. I, we did before we, you know, when we were small children. Um, but uh, but we, uh, we don't remember that uh, so clearly as we, uh, as we re remember the world that's basically saturated with, with text. And... Um, and just to kind of uh, invoke something like a, a, you know, using the imagination as a kind of organ of research almost, we can try to cast ourselves back into a time before libraries, again, before text. Um, imagine all of the, all of the, uh, not only all of the information that we, that we have access to through our text that's kind of recorded in text, but imagine also um, the stories and stories that we just, we assume that all the stories that we live with and whether it's fairy tales or these Greek myths uh, from Plato, um, whatever stories that, that, that are really, you know, stories and histories too, history. So not only, not only um, uh, what we think of as fiction, but also what we think of as our own past. Um, today we imagine that we, if we want to learn about our past, we can go to an archive somewhere. And even if we don't do that, we, have, we think in principle it would be possible. Um, imagine the, to cast ourselves back to this kind of Pre, pre uh, textual like pre literate Greece, you know, uh, in the kind of Homeric time and the pre Homeric time. And what I'm saying about Greece, this is a, a, a generic statement that applies to any any culture uh, throughout any time, any any you know cr period in chronological history. That's not what's really at stake. What's really at stake is the kind of um, the evolutionary trajectory of any given culture. The, the moment it moves to writing, something changes. And something is gained, certainly, but, but I'm just trying to at least help us to enter into a, a, a sense and a vision of what might be lost. And there's, uh, there's a kind of, um, I guess for lack of a better word, there's almost like a, a magic element that's lost. And, and, and that might sound strange, but let me try to explain what I, what I have in mind. Um, Again, we, have, we imagine that, that all the stories and all of our past and all of our history, it's encoded somewhere, uh, recorded in a library. We could access it if we wish to. So even if we don't, we think it's there. Um, somebody from, from the ancient times couldn't possibly have thought that way. Um, rather, the, the access to these stories was only kind of by means of an inspired bard or prophet. And so you picture somebody like Homer um, after, you know, I, somehow I picture around a fire or something after uh, after the the work during the day, and people uh, people seek out this uh, these kind of bards or storytellers uh, for the sake of um, you know not unlike the way we bother to go on the internet ever or go to a library or open a book, it gives us access to this uh, different realm that's not you know it gives us access to a it gives us access to a presence that's not only the present. But it's like a transcendent presence. It's like a presence that's transcendent of the present moment, a presence that transcends time and temporal sequence. And and, and just imagine a kind of, again, you don't have books and, and stories everywhere. You 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 wait until the bard, uh, you know, becomes inspired and sort of lights up and begins to pour forth these uh, stories and histories and tales, uh, as though kind of like an aperture from from some other some other world, some other realm. Um, again, for us, access to this is it's so commonplace now by way of uh, first writing and then, and then of, course, uh, of course, technology and the internet. Um, it's almost like it's so common that, that our, in the ancient times, it was, uh, it was you know, uh, extraordinary and, and made rare and special by lack of access to it. Uh, and today it's kind of made rare and special by lack of our ability to appreciate it. Um, there's kind of like a glut of supply, it, but for that reason, we, um, you know, I, we will tend to undervalue it. Okay.
And so I, I hope that at least gives a kind of a vision of the world that Plato kind of, uh, he's almost uh, traversing or has one foot in both worlds. He's, he, he's, he's of course living in a literary, literate culture, but he's, but he's uh, far enough back in the past that, that the, you know, the ancient time, it's not a, it's not a faded memory like it is for us. It's still very much very active and very present for Plato. So he's able to draw on this. And, and, and you know, I think it gives, gives him the ability to, to recognize what has been kind of, a, you know, dried up and, 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 and sacrificed for the sake of uh, kind of putting everything down, uh, you know, nail, nailing everything, inscribing everything down into uh, text. Um, the living word is, is sacrificed, you know, and uh, it's like crucified on the page of, of uh, on, the, on the parchment or something laid out to dry. Um, and so I hope that at least gives, again, a, a sense for something of a, a background, you know, basic, the, the, the theme of technology and, and, then, and then history and, and, and how we can sort of conceptualize this. Um, and, and by learning about history, actually also gain some new insight into our own, our own the world that we live in today. Um, and so uh, I think from here, there is a, a natural transition to think about writing, again, not only what writing allows us to do, but um, what it does to us. And, and everything is this way, but writing it's so powerful that it's this way to an extraordinary degree, I think. And we can think about, uh, and Plato emphasizes and underscores this point, not only in this specific myth, but also uh, and probably most notably and most memorably in the parable of the cave. And this is where he, he just emphasizes and brings our attention to the uh, contradictory and mutually exclusive relationship between uh, presuming oneself to uh, be wise and uh, and on the one hand and the ability to acquire and attain that wisdom on the other hand uh, and and Socrates of course a kind of embodiment or living example of this but we see the the, the prisoners in the cave they're uh, confined to the cave uh, precisely because they are unwilling to entertain the notion that there could be anything beyond the cave and so uh, what writing, in a kind of, in a very analogous way, what Plato warns that writing can do to us is to, uh, is to instill in us a false, uh, a false uh, sense in the security and, the, uh, and the, um, the comprehension of our knowledge, uh, whereas in fact uh, we have access to this information um, by, by way of writing, it can instill in us a false sense that we actually know this thing that we have access to. That it's you know that it's part of our knowledge that we've truly understood something. We can make a distinction between information and knowledge, or between um, access to information and understanding of that information, or even between knowledge and understanding. It's one thing to have knowledge as though like collection of propositions, but it's another thing to have understood that knowledge. And Plato, uh, Plato's concept of memory, it's maybe a little bit different than we think, uh, but I uh, but but I th I think that Plato is uh, he's He's, he he uh, is perceiving something that that uh, remains true today, and that's the uh, the intimate relationship between memory and and knowledge and wisdom. And in a, a different dialogue, which we will encounter a little bit later, uh, the dialogue is called the Mino dialogue. Plato actually describes uh, learning as a kind of uh, um, the Greek word is anamnesis, and it means something like an unforgetting. So the idea is like you uh, or an aletheia. You lift the veil of forgetfulness, the veil of lethe, and uh, and then this this knowledge is revealed to you. Um, and what uh, and and so the idea is that writing actually, um, like Plato suggested, it's uh, it's destructive, and uh, it tends to disintegrate the memory. And so it's it's deleterious to the memory, and, and by the same token, uh, deleterious to to wisdom itself. And, and again, it's, it's precisely this, uh, this um, false, uh, false belief uh, in our possession of something that sort of kills or stifles our desire to attain that thing. Yeah. It's like we don't desire anything we think we already possess. Uh, believing, you know, under the conceit that we already possess wisdom, just because we have access, just because our... We, we already have smarts because we have uh, uh, smartphones. 
uh, just merely because uh, under under the the pretense of wisdom, we in fact um, uh, prevent ourselves from from seeking it uh, by possessing something we um, in, in principle we won't seek something we already possess. Yeah. And and this and, and so in some way what Plato is uh, kind of warning us against is we're sort of risking to outsource our well for Plato outsourcing our memory onto the the written page. Uh, and for us, it's it's, I mean, it's 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 orders of magnitude beyond that. It's like outsourcing our own smarts onto our smartphone, and um, and again we we then we sort of uh, entertain the false, the false uh, the kind of illusion or delusion that uh, that we're that we have this kind of intelligence that in fact we've we forfeit and externalized onto something other than us. Um, the, when we think about the memory, and this is certainly how it is for Plato. And this again will, uh, comes up in the, the Mino dialogue, but he, he says the idea is the memory, um, all everything that's that's knowable is syngenius is the word he uses, uh, syngenius, and the idea is like it shares a common, um, it shares a common uh, origin or source, and uh, and there's something to be said about the way that memory, um, in order to remember something, we have to be able to relate it to uh, everything else that we already. Uh, you know, think we know. There has to be a kind of a certain coherence. It's almost impossible to to memorize something that's fundamentally juxtaposed and fundamentally fundamentally at odds with ev with everything else that you think you know. This thing, it just it won't find a place in your concepts. Um, and and I think we don't notice this because almost kind of like a it's um it's a uh, we don't notice this because precisely because we don't notice those things in the first place. We don't really notice anything that we're not able to notice. We don't notice anything that doesn't, um, in some ways, resonate with with what we think is uh, relevant and true and significant. And Plato again is he's he's warning us that writing will kind of uh, it might it might risk sabotaging this this uh, innate capacity we have to uh, to make sense of things and to order things. Uh, um, and uh, again, one definition of philosophy from from John Newman is uh, something like. Philosophy is reason exercised upon knowledge, and so the idea is uh, that we might lose we might lose this inner capacity, this capacity for inner initiative to exercise our reason upon our knowledge. And we might just imagine that the knowledge, you know, it's already there, it's already at my fingertips. Um, if it ever, I don't really need to know it. If I ever, if it, if I, I don't need to know it already. If I ever um, am confronted with a situation that requires certain information, I just kind of. Um, I believe uh, as a kind of, um, from the outside, I just believe that I can, I, I will have access to it and I can access it if I ever need it. So in the meantime, I don't need to know it. Um, and again, that's partly true, but I think uh, Plato, he's, he's just helping us to, uh, to perceive the, uh, the, the, the far side of, or the other side of this, you know, the complementary side of this. Um, and so one way to think of this is, is to imagine the difference between um, Forgive me. Uh, the difference between uh, text that can uh, between the memory and uh, and text, which is not the same thing as a memory, really. It can only at most serve as a reminder for something that we already have worked upon with that inner initiative, that reason we've re knowledge that we've already exercised our reason upon. And certainly, the text can be very useful in that respect by allowing us to um, uh, by allowing us to sort of. Uh, it kind of uh, can can remind again remind us of work we've already done inner work we've already done uh, again reason exercised upon our knowledge um, and you know just by analogy we can imagine uh, we just know this this goes without saying it's not the same you know to be a doctor to be a physician physician um, it's not adequate merely to have access to um, you know a medical library or a big tome of materia medica. We wouldn't, we wouldn't ever make that kind of mistake. Um, we wouldn't make the mistake of, um, we wouldn't mistake our, you know, uh, the experience of a piece of music, with that same music um, denoted as a as a musical score. Right? Those things are fundamentally different. Um, Plato's kind of bringing our attention to the fact that we might risk making an analogous mistake, but not recognizing it, uh, between having knowledge and uh, perceiving the sort of signs and um, you know indications of that knowledge 
on a uh, written page. Those are not the same thing. Um, we know this because, uh, for instance, in uh, Plato's dialogue is written in Greek. Um, I don't presume that uh, I don't. If I don't speak Greek, then the Greek doesn't do any good for me. Uh, the the Greek, even if it's written down, it's like I have to already know something in order to be able to benefit from it in any way on the page. And we can think of this too as as a kind of scale or a gradient. It's like the more that I already know, the more uh, um, the more connections and and associations that any given piece of text can reveal to me. Again, because they're not exactly contained in the text, they they uh, they're somehow they're not actually. You know, of course, a text it's it's really it's um, scratch marks on a piece of paper, really, and it, it's it's virtue um, lies entirely in its ability to. Uh, kind of awaken in in the reader to awaken uh, knowledge and, and and sort of inner vision, so insight. Um, but again, Plato's warning us that we will we will risk um, sort of conflating those two things. Um, and so uh, that I think that that probably I hope that's served to sort of reveal again this distinction between the the appearance of knowledge and. And, um, and knowledge itself. And so, um, Plato, of course, he's not saying, well, what he's, he, he somehow he recommends, and again, in this kind of ironic fashion, which is, he's of course recommending this, uh, we're reading this, so he's recommending this in writing. He's recommending against writing. Uh, and of course, this is what I uh, sort of alluded to at the, uh, the outside of this lecture. But, uh, but he's suggesting the difference between um, when something is written down, it's kind of like frozen onto the page. And um, uh, by contrast, when something is spoken in speech, and again, I gave the image of the bard speaking, but we can also imagine this as dialogue. When something is in dialogue, um, it's, still, it's, like it's still living. Yeah? It's, it's not frozen onto the page, it's organic, and it allows for the exploration in real time, in living speech, it allows for the exploration of Again, sort of organic connections that arise from one thing to the next thing, um, and and uh, in a way that that writing doesn't allow that because the whole structure is already uh, set down on the page, um, and and there are just a thousand connections that can be made uh, in in a in a uh, you know in, in dialogue in living speech, um, even just to take something like uh, like the idea of freezing freezing uh, turning something to you know freezing the the, the, the speech onto the page, it's, it's, the same, it's, it's so analogous to, uh, to turning something to stone, which of course invokes, and invokes the, the other Greek myth of, of uh, the Gorgon and uh, you know, Medusa with the, the, the uh, hair of snakes, the serpent, the serpent hair, and, uh, and, and, and how she, uh, with a single glance, she turns, she turns a person to stone, uh, to, to meet eyes with her, turn, turns you to stone. It, it, you know, it, it kind of it freezes your mind is a way to think about this. And uh, uh, folks may recall from the Greek myth when uh, Perseus finally succeeds in slaying the Medusa, the, his only, um, his, the, the way he accomplishes that is by, um, is by way of a mirror. And so he uses the mirror in order to uh, approach the Gorgon without actually looking at her. And we could think of this as a kind of uh, injunction that, that the only way to, um, the only way to, to, to mitigate against the deleterious influences of writing, which would sort of like, it would, it would uh, sort of kill our thoughts. It would, again, turn them to stone. The way to pre uh, prevent against that is to be continually, um, to, is, to, is to look at it through reflection, like to be reflecting always on what you read and not only just, uh, just, just assimilating it because, because, because it, will, it will, again, it will kill our thoughts. And, and so we can think of the, the, the mirror as a symbol of reflection. Where you're not only uh, you're not only assimilating thoughts from reading, but you're also reflecting on them, and in this way you're sort of uh, attempting, at least, to almost the way you can reconstitute uh, dried uh, dried fruit in water. In the same way, you can sort of reconstitute uh, uh, desiccated uh, speech as as uh, written text. You can attempt to reconstitute it through engagement and active thinking, active reflection upon it. And that way you you stave off death um, in the same way that Perseus staves off death with the mirror against Medusa. Um, another, just 
a connection to another myth or another story that's it's too um it's sort of it's too felicitous to just ignore is when plato says uh i mean he, he one he, he tries to uh he tries to express the um the uh the 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 um the fundamental deficiency of writing he tries to express that by with another analogy and the analogy that he uses is is he says that um no no good gardener um, would plant seeds in soil that was sort of unfertile. Uh, if a gardener really cared about about the seeds he was planting, um, he or she would ensure that those seeds are uh, sown into soil that is fertile. So, um, and and he says by analogy, um, uh, he said, and, and and Phaedrus agrees with him, of course. That Phaedrus is, is Socrates' dialogue partner in this dialogue. Um, and uh, Socrates says, then, then uh, you know, this gardener, this sower, um, he will not seriously incline to write his thoughts in water, so to speak, with pen and ink, sowing words which can neither speak for themselves nor teach the truth adequately to others. Phaedrus, of course, agrees with him. Um, and in, interestingly, the Greek word here uh, is, uh, as may not come as a surprise, uh, sowing words, it, it's sowing logoi. So the, the, the fundamental word is logos. And so uh, Socrates says, you wouldn't sow logoi, you wouldn't sow uh, logos into, uh, into uh, a kind of medium, into soil that's not, that's not receptive and that's not fertile of it. Uh, it's, it would be analogous to like talking into a brick wall. Um, we know that the wall, neither, will it, 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 neither does it hear your words nor will it be able to respond. Yeah, it's like talking to a statue or to an, to an, to an idol. Um, and so he says, no, 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 you would ensure to, uh, if you cared about uh, your, your logoi, you would ensure to sow them in fertile soil. And um, this, uh, it's just uh, such a close allusion to one of Jesus's parables, one of probably the most famous parable, uh, the parable of the sower. Um, it's, it's told in, in all three synoptic gospels. And um, it's, it's pretty straightforward, but I think it's, it's quite revealing. And especially through this connection to, uh, to Plato's dialogue, um, Jesus just basically says, uh, Behold, there went out a sower to sow. So somebody goes out to plant seeds. Um, and it came to pass, as he sowed, that some of the seeds fell by the wayside. And fowls, so birds of the air, came and devoured them up. So some of the seeds are lost to the birds. And some fell, some of the seeds fell on stony ground, where, it had not much, where the ground had not much earth. So the soil is, it's poor, the soil is poor. Um, and immediately, it sprang up uh, in this poor soil, uh, but it had no depth. Um, and so when the sun came up, the, the little uh, sprouts, um, they were scorched by the sun because they had no root, and so they withered away. Um, some seed fell along the thorns, but the thorns grew up and choked that seed, um, and therefore the seed yielded no fruit because it was choked by the thorns. Um, finally, though, other seed fell on good ground and did yield fruit that sprang up and increased and brought forth some 30, some 60, some hundredfold. Um, uh, Jesus says, uh, uh, unto them who hath ears to hear, let them hear. Uh, the sower, and, and then he, he goes on to explain the kind of, uh, often he's just presenting and uh, speaking in parables, but uh, from time to time, and this is one of those rare occasions, he kind of uh, explains the meaning of the parable. So the meaning that the parable was meant to represent. Um, and he literally says it's it's amazing uh, kind of connection. Um, he says uh, he he says the seeds that are being sown here. He says the sower soweth the word. The sower soweth the word. Um, we see that that in English uh, probably just pass over it um, if we uh, even encounter it at all. Um, the when he says the sower soweth the word, uh, the all of the gospels were translated from Greek. This is literally the same phrase that Plato uses in um, in the Phaedrus dialogue, he says, um, again, the word is logos. It's the sower soweth the logos. And, and so uh, this, uh, what I think this can help us to do is um, see the way, I guess, in which um, <laughs> many things, obviously, there's, there's all of the kind of internal metaphorical and semantic connections that, that the, 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 those two parables together um, can, can serve us to reveal. And obviously we can think of, you know, if it's sowing the word, then, then um, so in, and word can also, the word logos, we're kind of limited in English when we translate it and render it into a single thing. This itself, this kind of being forced to, uh, to uh, fix something down into a single valence, um, this again, it's expressive of the, the basic fact of writing. Um, if this were in dialogue, um, 
we could explain it and we could uh, uh, it could be talked over and explored uh, you know the, the valences of the of the word uh, word the word word or the word logos for instance and but but logos you know it, it it's related to speech it's related to argument it's related to logic it's related to proportion it's related to coherence um, Heraclitus one of the first uh, people to use this uh, this uh, one of the first people actually to write down this this word logos um, he thought of the logos as like nothing less than the the ordering the intelligibility of the cosmos like whatever makes the universe intelligible to the mind that's something that the mind shares with the world it's a kind of internal coherence or harmony or order um, and so and so uh, but again um, this uh, and so obviously we can think of uh, you know the word whatever the fertile what is the, uh, the the analog for the fertile soil well it has something to do with our own uh, our own um, minds our own hearts our own uh, souls our own intelligence has to be receptive and this is again this perennial theme from Plato which is uh, one way to ensure that it won't be receptive to ensure that your mind is a kind of uh, you know stony ground or to ensure that the birds will just uh, will come and, and eat up the seed is to assume that you already know everything or assume that you don't need to be smart because your smartphone is smart. Yeah. Um, but again, these kind of connections, they are all um, sort of obviated or at least concealed or rendered, rendered opaque the moment that, that you know, a tr for example, a translation occurs and logos becomes word and then we think, well, I know what a word means. Uh, again, that's the fundamental gesture of saying like well I already know this or I don't it's not it's not worth my time to to think about it because I already I, I already know this um, the minute we encounter a, a, such a familiar term as quote word we think it's not it doesn't it doesn't deserve it doesn't merit any further attention any further inquiry um, and so I, I think that's probably more than adequate to uh, to just convey um, convey Plato's basic argument here which is that uh, on the one, while on the one hand we sort of will assume that writing fosters the advance and the progress of knowledge, um, at least as uh, at least as compelling of an argument can be made uh, that it actually vitiates that progress and it, it, it draws us backwards and um, and kind of uh, pulls the um, pulls the wool over our eyes, so to speak. Um, and so, but again, I think I think that uh, what I've said so far, I, I hope that it's at least uh, adequate to um, to really uh, convey the um, the uh, the force of Plato's argument and the you know the, the way in which um, he, he it, it, it's um, the, both the force and also the relevance, the relevance to our day. That this is not just he's talking about an Egyptian king, um, and uh, and so we might think, well, this is about an Egyptian king. It can't be about me. Uh, but this is, um, you know, the again, um, we have to, uh, the, the moment I approach a dialogue with that kind of attitude or that kind of mindset, um, it's a kind of self, self-fulfilling or self, um, self-validating proposition because uh, if I assume that it doesn't have any relevance, then I won't seek for any relevance. Um, but I, I do think uh, that's, that's probably adequate. The last, uh, the last uh, of the ba ba three basic points that I just thought were worth bringing up, and this one will be pretty short, but it's just the idea of in which um, in a dialogue, so the idea, I would call it something like abstraction or alienation, that the written word can uh, affect upon us. Um, and so, uh, so in a dialogue or in a conversation with somebody or uh, listening to a bard uh, recount um, you know, uh, epic tales and, and history. Um, uh, in comparison, uh, if I'm reading, uh, uh, if I'm reading text, there's a further level of, of distance or abstraction or alienation between myself and the speaker. Um, in one case, the speaker is immediate. In another case, the speaker is, uh, well, uh, further, uh, further alienated. And we see this just increasingly with technology. Um, where it's like uh, we don't we don't often know who's on the other side. Interestingly, this could be starting to change now uh, as as the institution of writing actually begins to sort of uh, slowly fray or disintegrate. Maybe um, I only say that because uh, I am certain that people read fewer books than they did not very long ago. 
and books are, you know, the written word, it's, I, I do think there's a trend toward that's gradually being replaced by, um, by different forms of communication and whether that's um, TikTok videos or maybe um, even those, uh, even emotion symbols in the, uh, so emojis in the, um, in text messages. This is again, it's a little bit, it's like, go, it's going back, it's going backwards. It's moving from an alphabetical speech to a hieroglyphical speech, like hieroglyphs. Of course, the Egyptians preceded the Greeks and they had a hieroglyphic alphabet. Um, but, and you can imagine, uh, you know, a further uh, transformation. Um, and so this is just the idea that uh, it, it kind of, it fosters a sense of abstraction or, or, or separation. And um, we begin to just uh, look on not only speakers, but also the way in which, um, you know, the world of nature and, 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 and objects. Um, and alienation is, of course, a, that, that itself is, is quite an immense topic. And, and uh, probably most famous, famous thinker associated with that term is actually Karl Marx. And he had a lot of interesting uh, points that, that he kind of articulated around alienation. He's certainly not the only one, but, but he is one of the most memorable figures to have uh, described the effects of it. But, but the idea of alienation, it, it's, it's, um, it also relates to just the way in which most, most of the artifacts that we encounter today, um, we don't know who was on the other side of them. In a traditional society, we would have, everything we encountered, we would have uh, been able to, um, we would have known, we would have been able to sense the, the presence on the other side of it. So even a, something like simple, like a cup or a table, we would have known the carpenter or the or the potter. Yeah? Uh, today, who knows? It was produced in an assembly line on the other side of the earth, right? And um, and so again, this just it fosters a kind of just an, an aloofness, a general aloofness or alienation from uh, from lived experience. And uh, and again, text is is a kind of um, it's a it's a uh, it embodies that kind of dis distance and aloofness. And so that's, uh, I've covered now the three things. Uh, one was again, the, the, the kind of internal contradiction of technology. Uh, the second one was again, that, that fundamental platonic theme of, of, uh, of the appearance of knowledge versus knowledge, or the, appearance, the, the seeming wise versus being wise. Um, and then the, the third thing was just this, this kind of uh, alienation or abstraction. Um, and, and so that's, a, that's, uh, I'm, that's probably a good place to, to wind up this lecture. The last point that's worth making, though, and um, this is something of a, uh, this is, um, I don't know what to say about this. Uh, you can be the judge of what to say about this. Um, whenever we're talking about a myth, there's, um, there's both what the myth um, represents or what it's an image of on the one hand, um, and, 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 and these are not always separate things. We see in the Plato of the Cave in Plato's Parable of the Cave, there's something so effective about the Parable of the Cave because these things are actually very close, these two things I'm about to say. But one is like what the myth is, uh, often there's like a moral of the story, so to speak, in a myth. Certainly in the case, uh, in this myth, that's the case. That's the one side, which is the moral of the story. And, and that's what we've spent uh, most of this lecture uh, exploring, is the moral of the story and the semantic connections and associations um, between, uh, between, you know, what's represented in the myth and what it's meant to represent, um, in, uh, in, in other, in other areas. So that's one element of a myth. And we, so we could think of it again as the moral of the, or moral of the myth or the meaning of the myth. But another element of the myth is, uh, the, the basic structure of the myth and the internal structure and the internal dynamics of the myth. And that's the last thing that I would just like to bring up here. I think it's worth at least considering. Um, in the Parable of the Cave, uh, we would describe this as a kind of, um, uh, a sort of like a, 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 you know, being bound on the bottom of the cave and then a, a, a release, but a, in a, 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 a arduous ascent, some kind of uh, illumination and then a descent. Um, and again, these are just rough terms, but that's often all you can, um, all, all that's, that's, uh, that all that you can say by way of specificity. It, it, the same, I think the, the same difficulty, it's the same difficulty that one encounters in trying to describe the, um, the structure of a piece of music. Um, there's certainly movement and change and development and evolution and retardation and back and forth, but it's not always clear how to describe it in words 
it's the same with a myth. There's a kind of inner music to the myth. Here we have a case in which uh, Thoth, somebody comes uh, and, and uh, trying to, again, kind of like offer gifts, trying to give something, um, trying to uh, proffer uh, technology. It, but you have somebody that's kind of standing like a sentinel and, and, saying, um, and, and being discriminating and saying yes to this, no to that. This is, of course, the King Thomas. He's serving in this role of being a, um, a sort of gatekeeper or a march warden. And he's, he's determining what should be allowed to enter and what shouldn't be allowed to enter. And I think that's quite significant. And often, um, often you know, Plato's myths are, are not, they're more than, they're, they're always am, multivalent. Um, and, but I think it's significant. And, and in some ways it could be pointing us to, as always, the, the, the myth is, is giving uh, pictorial or, or uh, um, visible form to something that's invisible. I think it's worth just meditating on what those two influences, so Thoth and Thomas, or those two impulses, what they're meant to represent. And one way to think of it is, is um, a kind of uh, Thoth represents everything that's encroaching on us from maybe even technology, but just, just everything from the world. And, um, and whether it's what people are saying or what we're reading or what we're seeing in the media or what we're encountering just in the broadest sense, broadly construed. And Thomas represents some element of the mind or the soul that is, um, that is not just totally indiscriminate, but that's rather uh, being, um, you know, being, being careful and uh, fundamentally uh, being a critical thinker. And this, the, 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 the word criti uh, critical, it, uh, in the Greek, it comes from a Greek word, krinein, uh, and it, it literally means to separate, uh, to discern, to parse, to discriminate. And so in some ways, like Thomas, uh, one way to think of this is that Thomas represents the critical thinker in us. And, um, and uh, we, see, we see the virtue of that in a myth uh, like this. And so that's, that's just a little bit of, um, of, uh, of uh, speculation from, from my side, but it's also an invitation to consider. And I don't know if it's a question of whether it's, it's, um, it's incorrect or correct, but rather a question of what, what, it can, uh, what, what it can reveal if we consider the myth from that perspective. Okay, and so I think that's, um, that's a good place for me to stop. Uh, thank you, everyone, and um, best wishes from me until next time. I hope that uh, something that I said can serve to um, foster uh, further discussion and uh, further, further, um, further inspiration. And so uh, best wishes uh, until next time.